thank you very much to the organisers for giving me this opportunity to present uh, my work. So what I'm going to take you through is our recent publication, which is looking at a new protac based target validation uh, technology that we've developed. And so my name is Becky and I am a laboratory head at the Ubiquitin, in the Ubiquitin Signaling Division at WeHi in Melbourne, Australia. Okay, so I wanted to start off with this uh, review that I read, which really made an impact on me. And so within this review, they mentioned that drugs fail in the clinic for two basic reasons. So they either don't work or they prove to be unsafe. And what I really liked was this quote from David Sinkowski, who was the director of biotherapeutics at Zencore, who said that both of these reasons are often the direct result of sloppy early target validation. And I really like this because I, I agree that target validation is incredibly important. And this report here is getting a little bit old now, but I think it still was a really important study. And here they showed the uh, probability of success of taking a drug from phase one clinical trials all the way to the market. And what they showed was that the probability of success was around 9.6%, um, which, is, which is actually really low. And they mentioned in this report that there are a number of reasons as to why this might be. So there could be internal funding decisions, um, internal commercial decisions. Um, but they also mentioned that there was a clear lack of clinical validation of target proteins. And this was contributing to this um, reduction in the success of drugs that can actually make it to market. And so target validation is something that we really need to focus on and we really need to invest time and energy and effort into before we start investing that, that money and that effort into developing a drug against the protein um, of interest. And so this is where we got really excited about this, this tag technology. And we got excited because this allows us to virtually remove any protein within the proteome um, by just attaching a small generic tag to it. And so what it involves is using a tag, and I'll discuss some of these tags in the next couple of slides, and fusing your tag to your target protein of interest, and then using a generic degrader that interacts with the tag and interacts with an E3 ligase complex to allow ubiquitination and degradation of that fusion protein. And this gets around the need of having a degrader that interacts directly to your target, which we don't always have, because you can use these generic ones that interact with the tag. And what's really powerful about this technology is that uh, we can now chemically tune uh, destruction or degradation of virtually any protein within the proteome. We can also reversibly deplete proteins. And this is really important because this is more closely recapitulating real drug treatment scenarios, a lot more closely than, uh, say, genetic knockouts, where we knock out a gene from, from birth. And this also allows us to, um, unlike knockouts, to reduce the levels of a protein in an adult mouse um, in a particular disease situation. And then when we remove that drug, we're able to bring those, those protein uh, levels back. So I think it's a really powerful system for, um, for, for target validation. Now, there's a number of different uh, tag degrader systems that are available. And so we have uh, this FKBP system, which uses this small uh, FKBP, mutant FKBP tag, which is based off the FKBP12 protein. And we have degraders that interact with this mutant FKBP and recruit cerebellum E3 ligase complex. And just for simplicity throughout the talk, I've renamed the degraders um, according to the tag that they interact with and the substrate receptor that they bind. So this would be an FC degrader. We've also got uh, degraders for the FKBP system that recruit VHL, and we have these FB degraders. Outside of the FKBP tag, we have other tag systems like the HALO tag system. And for the HALO tag system, we've only got degraders for um, VHL, so we haven't got cerebellum degraders. Uh, and I'm just mentioning here one HALO degrader that was published uh, in this Tobol paper in 2018 because that's the one that we've used in our study. But there are other HALO protacs like HALO protac 3 that were published um, in 2015. Now outside of these systems, these are sort of the main systems that are available at the time when we started this study. 
Uh, there's also the Bromotag system. And so the Bromotag system was published recently uh, and uh, recruits the VHL, E3 ligase complex. However, um, as I said, the Bromotag system was published after we did this study. And so we haven't actually included um, this system within our study. And so when we started looking at these different tag systems, um, we started to look at what were the benefits uh, and what were the limitations of each system when we're thinking about choosing which system we want to use to validate our protein. Now, the FKBP mutant uh, tag system is actually really good because the tag is very small, so it's only 12 kilodaltons, and we have degraders against this tag um, for that recruit cerebellum and that recruit VHL. The other nice thing about the degraders that interact with the FKBP tag is that they function substoichiometrically, and so they are catalytic degraders. But the, the problem with the FKBP tag is that there's really not many other tools available for it. And if we're going to go to the effort of knocking the tag into the genomic locus of our protein of interest or potentially generate an animal that stably expresses um, this tagged form of, the, of our protein of interest, we might want to do more than just degrade the protein. And so having other um, tools that are available that allow us to interrogate the biology of our protein uh, with the tag that we've choosed can actually be um, quite important. Now the halo tag is a little bit bigger, so it's about 33 kilodalton, so around about the same size as GFP. Um, however, we only have VHL degraders, so we don't have cerebellum degraders, so that's one potential limitation. The other limitation is that these are non-catalytic degraders, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit about this on the next slide. But what's nice about the HALO tag is that uh, we have lots of different tools available um, through Promega that you can buy commercially to interrogate um, the function of your, of your protein, to look at the localization of your protein, just explore the biology a little bit more. Um, and at the same time, you have degraders where you can induce uh, degradation. So given that these were the only two systems, um, sort of protag-based systems that were available at the time, um, we looked at other tags that might actually be quite beneficial to uh, have degraders um, against. Uh, and the nanolook tag was interesting to us because the nanolook tag is quite small, so it's around 19 kilodaltons, and the nanolook tag has um, intrinsic luminescence properties, which can be um, quite a powerful uh, uh, technology. Now, at the time, there were no uh, nanolook degraders available, so there was a, a, an opportunity there. Um, but nicely similar to the HALO tag, because Nanolook is a trademark of ProMega, there's lots of different tools available for the Nanolook tag. So you've kind of got that flexibility. Um, if we did have degraders where you've got the luminescence capability, you could degrade the protein, but also study the biology of the protein. And so when I mentioned before that the FKBP degraders function substoichiometrically, this is because these degraders can um, bind the FKBP tag reversibly. And so they can interact with the tagged fusion protein, trigger ubiquitylation of the fusion protein, and then as that protein heads off to the proteasome to be degraded, this protag can then um, re-engage more substrate. Whereas the problem with the HALO tag system is that there's a um, covalent link that's formed between the halo tag protag and the halo tag. And so what actually happens is that this halo tag protein and the compound is actually consumed in the reaction. And so you need to maintain a one-to-one -one stoichiometry in this system to be able to get efficient degradation. And when we looked at nanolook binders, um, we were actually quite pleased to see that nanolook binders had been published. Uh, and this is a publication that came out of ProMega and the lead chemist at ProMega on the Nanolook um, project was, was Joel Walker. And so we reached out to Joel uh, and told him about our idea to generate Nanolook Protax and he was quite willing to collaborate, which was, which was really um, great. And what's good actually as well is that these Nanolook Protax, uh, sorry, these Nanolook inhibitors were uh, reversible inhibitors of Nanolook. So that gave us the opportunity to produce these substoichiometric uh, degraders. And so through a really great collaboration with uh, internally with the Chemistry Biology Division, uh, but also externally through, through ProMega, um, 
we were able to generate a series of Nanolook Cerebron degraders, and these were um, produced by the lead chemist Christoph Groman on this uh, on this project. And we also at the same time produced a series of Nanolook VHL Protax. The Nanolook VHL Protax though didn't work, so I'm not going to take you through any of that data, um, but if you're interested, it's in the paper. Um, and I'm just going to focus here on these Nanolook Cerebron um, Protax that we made. Now, ultimately, what we wanted to do was produce a new protag, but also we wanted to be able to benchmark and compare all the different tag systems against each other to see which one was um, the best. And so we produced this reporter protein here that contains the different tags we're interested in. So it's got a halo tag, it's got a mutant FKBP tag, and it's got an analog. Uh, and then we've also added this reporter protein in here, Firefly. We then made a very similar reporter protein, which instead of Firefly contains EGFP, and we use them for the different assays. Okay, so just testing our Nanolux Cerebron degrader series first, uh, what we used was our Firefly reporter, and here we're reading out Firefly luminescence. These are stable cells that express this reporter protein. And everything is under the doxycycline induction. So when we induce with doxycycline here, we can see really nice firefly luminescence. And when we treat with our different degraders, we can see here with Nanolux Cerebron 4 or NC4 that we see a really nice um, reduction in that firefly luminescence, almost back down to the baseline levels. So that was really encouraging. Now, just to make sure that this is actually degradation, uh, we did Western blot. And we can see that, again, we see a very similar pattern to what we saw with the luminescence. We can see a really beautiful degradation of this construct here with Nanolux Cerebron 4. Uh, and this, just to make a note here, this Nanolux Cerebron star is our inactive compound, and this is not able to induce the uh, degradation of the construct, so that's nice to see. Um, now, just a, a one comment on linker length. Now, I know we've seen in the literature quite a lot that uh, linker length can make a huge difference. Uh, and it does make a huge difference here as well with our nanotax. Now, I'm not a chemist at all. I'm a molecular biologist, uh, but I actually find that this really remarkable. And so the only difference between nanolook um, or NC4, NC3 and NC5 is this little region here within the linker. And the difference between NC4 and NC3 is that we have an extra two carbons and NC4 and NC5 is that we have one less carbon. And so when we look at how that actually impacts degradation, we can see that here NC4, which is our best compound, triggers nice degradation. But if we remove one carbon within that area of the linker, we almost completely abrogate the degradation of that construct. And we see this with our Firefly construct and also with our EGFP construct, where Nanolux Cerebron 5 doesn't degrade nearly as well nanolux cerebron 4. And this to me is, is uh, really interesting and it can be due to um, steric clashes that can occur between the, the substrate and the E3 ligase. Um, and we see this for a, a number of different uh, protax. So um, with halo linkers, uh, sorry, with halo protax, we also see that longer linkers are actually more favorable, similar to the BTK cerebron degrader. Whereas also it's important to acknowledge that in some situations, shorter linkers can actually be um, more favorable. Um, but yeah, I actually find that this um, is quite interesting that you can take out one carbon within the linker and completely abrogate the degradation of the substrate. Okay, so focusing now on um, Nanolux Cerebron 4, uh, we did a number of characterizations. I won't take you through all of them um, because I want to move on to the comparisons of the different systems. And so what we did was we took uh, the different systems that were available to us at the time. So the Nanolux system that we just generated, the two FKBP systems, which recruit VHL or Cerebron. And for the Cerebron system, we actually had two degraders, FC1 and FC2 and the HALO VHL system. And again, for this HALO VHL system, we had two degraders, HV1 and HV2. And we're really lucky um, through a collaboration with, with Alessio, we were able to obtain both of these degraders for this study. And so using our reporter protein, we're able to compare the degradation of each tag system against the same reporter protein. 
And so what we can see here again, so we're looking at firefly luminescence on the axis. When we uh, add doxycycline and induce the expression, we get a nice uh, induction of the luminescence. And then if we compare treatment with our different degraders, so I've just color coded everything here. So we've got our FKBP degraders in pink, uh, our halo degraders in, um, in green, and our nanolip degrader here in gold. We can see over concentration, um, uh, different concentrations that we can see uh, a really nice uh, titratable degradation of that construct. And what was um, encouraging was that our Nanolux system here uh, does compare to the other systems. Overall, I would say that the FKBP system is uh, superior to the other systems, um, but it was nice to see that our Nanolux system was actually uh, functioning quite similarly. We also see this characteristic hook effect here with our nanolux cerebellum compound, uh, where we start to lose degradation at the higher concentrations. And interestingly, we don't see that hook effect, or we don't see as much of a hook effect with these FKBP systems. Uh, and this could be due to the FKBP system forming a, a more cooperative complex um, uh, with this particular substrate, which uh, overcomes that hook effect. OK, so just to make sure that the degradation that we were seeing was actually mediated by the proteasome, we used a proteasome inhibitor, MG132, to see if we could block the degradation. And so again, using our reporter system, um, if we treat with our different degraders, we can see a really clear reduction in the luminescence with all of our different degraders. If we then co-treat with the proteasome inhibitor, MG132, in all of the cases, we are able to rescue the degradation um, to some degree. So that was encouraging. Uh, when we submitted the paper, the reviewers asked us to look at the durability of each tag degrader um, upon washout. Uh, and so we did this study. And um, basically what we did was, again, taking our reporter protein, this time using the EGFP version, uh, we treated with each compound for five hours and then we removed the uh, compound and replaced media and cultured the cells for either 24 or 48 hours to see how long we could sustain the, the loss of that protein uh, over time. And so uh, the FKBP degraders actually sustain the, the degradation quite well. And so you can see we get, especially with um, the FKBP BHL and FC1, uh, degrader, we can get nice sustained uh, degradation to maybe around 50%, even up to 48 hours. Whereas with our NC4 compound, even though we get really nice degradation at five hours, uh, we get almost complete recovery of that after 24 hours. But this is also sort of an important consideration because if you wanted a, a highly reversible system, you might choose something like the Nanolux um, system. Whereas if you wanted something that sustains knockdown for um, uh, an extended period of time, you might choose the FKBP system. Now, there is a limitation to the um, Nanolux cerebellum system that we generated, and that's that um, the Nanolux inhibitors are actually just that, they're Nanolux inhibitors. And so they inhibit the ability of the Nanolux enzyme to convert the substrate to produce luminescence. And you can see that demonstrated here. So if we compare our Nanolook uh, Cerebellum 4 compound to our inactive compound, the star compound, and here we look at Nanolook luminescence, so not Firefly, but Nanolook luminescence, we can see that we reduce the luminescence with our compass star, with our uh, Nanolook Cerebellum 4 compound, but with the star compound, we also reduce the luminescence. And so that's really problematic if you want to use nanolook luminescence uh, to measure degradation because the protax, although they do trigger degradation, they're also inhibiting the ability of the enzyme to trigger, um, to convert that substrate. And so we wanted to make this a little bit more accessible and see whether we could find a concentration and a window where you could actually use nanolook luminescence to monitor degradation. And so for this, we titrated down and we reduced the concentration of, de of the degraders uh, to try and find a concentration where um, our NC4 compound would trigger reduction and that would re represent degradation, but our control compound wouldn't trigger um, a reduction because uh, it wasn't at a high enough concentration to inhibit the enzyme. And so if we use it at a low concentration, like 15.6 nanomolar, you can see that we do actually reduce 
the levels of the um, reporter protein to um, uh, quite significantly. Whereas if we compare this to our inactive compound here, we don't see degradation. Uh, we don't see a huge reduction in that luminescence. But what's really important is not just to compare the um, nanolux cerebellum 4 compound to the star compound, it's also to compare um, minus plus rescue um, with MG132, or in this case, we did also the ML MLN inhibitor. And so here you can see that when we treat with our um, NC4 compound, we get reduction in luminescence, but when we co-treat with these inhibitors, we're able to reduce um, that luminescence. And that, so that does show you that you can use nanolook luminescence to monitor degradation, but you do just need to be a little bit mindful that it's important to add these controls. So it's important to add in uh, the star compound, which is the inactive compound, to make sure that you're not just inhibiting the luminescence from the enzyme, and also to make sure that you are reliably reading out degradation by adding in these um, inhibitors. Okay, so next we wanted to compare all of these systems uh, using a physiological situation, uh, using a biological readout. And so something that we were quite familiar with was a protein called MLKL. And MLKL is a protein that activates a form of cell death called necroptosis. And so we tagged MLKL with um, our, our three different tags, so the HALO tag, FKBP or Nanolook, uh, and we also produced an untagged version of MLKL. And we expressed these different uh, versions of MLKL in MLKL knockout cells. And we can see here that uh, this is everything's done in an inducible system. So when we induce expression, we can see nice expression of the wild type, um, untagged MLKL. We can also see clear expression of the HALO, FK, HALO FKBP, and also Nanolook. Um, however, you can tell immediately that the tagged forms do impact the expression of the, the protein, and that's just something that um, you need to consider. Um, however, what I'll show you in the next slide is that this reduction in expression doesn't impact the ability of MLKL to drive cell death comparably to the wild type. Okay, so when we um, induce necroptosis in cells, in necroptosis competent cells like HG29s, what we usually do is add this cocktail um, to the cells. And so this cocktail contains the ligand TNF and then two inhibitors, SNACMEDIC uh, and ZBAD. And what this cocktail does is it activates the TNF signaling pathway, activates MLKL and triggers necroptosis. And so just asking the very first question, can each of our tag proteins um, function? Um, can they trigger cell death? Um, yeah, can they... Can they, do they not impact the function of MLKL? Because this is really important when you use these systems, you wanna make sure that the tag that you're adding to your protein doesn't impact the function. And so here we're looking at live cells. Um, and here we've got, if we just focus here on this induced state in the presence of our cocktail, in our MLKL knockout cells, we have lots of live cells, which we would expect because the MLKL knockout, they can't trigger cell death. When we reconstitute wild type MLKL, we can see that we reduce that cell viability. So that's what we would expect. But what was also really nice to see was that we, when we reconstitute with the HALO, FKBP or Nanolook versions of MLKL, we can equally reduce, uh, equally induce that, uh, that cell killing. And so that shows us that all of our different tagged forms of MLKL are actually functional, which is, like I said, really important. Okay, so we then compared the ability of each of the degraders to reduce this cell death by degrading MLKL. And I'm going to just focus on one first and take you through this, and then I'll show you the results for all of them. Okay, so if we start here, basically what we have is, again, live cells on this axis. We're looking at MLKL knockouts reconstituted with either untagged MLKL or FKBP tagged MLKL and everything is treated with our cocktail. Now when we, if we just compare minus plus induction, when we induce untagged MLKL or FKBP tagged MLKL, we can see in both situations, we're able to trigger necroptosis, we're able to reduce cell viability. 
But when we treat with our FKBP VHL degrader, in the untagged situation, obviously because there's no tag, we don't trigger degradation, we still induce necroptosis. And we can see that really clearly here. When we treat our tagged cells, though, with our FKBP VHL degrader, and we recruit VHL and ubiquitolate this tagged fusion, we degrade MLKL and therefore the cells should survive. And we see that demonstrated really clearly here over a wide concentration range. And this was actually really remarkable when I saw this under the microscope because I wasn't expecting um, these degraders to be uh, so proficient at uh, degrading uh, this protein and being able to protect against cell death. And so we can really see that we see almost complete protection against cell death right up to the same level as the, uh, the knockout. And so if we then compare the results across all of the different degraders, so here we've got our VHL degrader, this was the data that I showed you in the previous slide, um, versus our two FKBP cerebellum degraders, we can see that again, uh, in both situations, we are able to really nicely reduce the cell killing, and this is because we're degrading MLKL, although uh, the cerebellum degraders do drop off a little bit at these lower concentrations, so they're not functioning as well as, at lower concentrations as the VHL version. What was interesting though was with the halo degraders. So with the halo degraders, we, we do again protect at these higher concentrations, um, right up to the same levels as the knockout. So they are functioning quite well, but we see this really sharp drop off of um, in the ability of these degraders to protect against cell death. And I think that's due to that, these degraders not functioning um, substoichiometrically. What was quite encouraging to see was that our nanolux cerebellum degrader um, is actually able to um, reduce MLK on nanolux to a level that can uh, protect against cell death. So we can actually have a um, protection against uh, a physiological readout here, which was really encouraging uh, to see. And so using these systems, we can do some really nice comparisons. So we can um, have a look at the whether or not the degradation that we see does mimic the uh, degradation that uh, does mimic the protection that we see in cell death. Uh, and that's exactly what we see here. So here we can uh, use the same E3 ligase complex. So in both situations, we recruit VHL, but um, in each situation, we have a different tag on the same substrate protein. And with the FKBP system, you can see that we see really beautiful, robust degradation over a wide concentration range. And this reflects the protection in cell death that we're able to see. With the halo VHL degrader, though, um, we're not able to uh, degrade MLKL halo as much as we do within the FKBP system. Uh, and then this really clearly recapitulates the um, lack of protection that we see at these lower concentrations. And so I guess what's really important here when you're choosing one of these systems is to just make sure that you are comparing the different systems um, with your substrate protein to choose the system that's the most appropriate um, for your particular protein of interest. Now, I just wanted to finish with um, some data that we have looking at our NC4 compound in vivo, because I think that this is uh, really exciting and really encouraging. And so we have a mouse that expresses a uh, construct that contains EGFP and nanolook. And we've taken a retroorbital bleed from that mouse and then just done a crude white blood cell prep. Uh, and this is just a control here on the left hand side to show that this mouse does express what it should express. Um, we can see a nice clear shift in the uh, EGFP peak showing that um, over control mice, we see that our EGFP nanolook is expressed within these mice. But what we can then do is we can then treat with either a vehicle control or our um, NC4 degrader compound. And here we've used 30 milligrams per gig. Uh, in the vehicle situation, you can see everything here is EGFP positive. And when we treat for four hours or eight hours, everything remains EGFP positive. But when we treat with our NC4 degrader, 
you can see we see this really nice shift back into this EGFP negative population after four hours and it's sustained at eight hours, showing us that um, this construct is able to be degraded by our NC4 compound in vivo. And so we have more uh, studies that we're following up now, looking at um, how this protein works, uh, which organs and tissues this, uh, sorry, how this degrader works and which organs and tissues this degrader um, can work within. And so that will be a follow-up study. And so I just wanted to finish with acknowledging everyone who has been involved within the study. I did mention people throughout, um, but a huge thank you to Christoph Groman, who I said was the lead chemist on this project. Also Joel Walker, who provided all the nanolock inhibitors to allow us to make these degraders. Um, obviously my lab, and I've got just a few images of my lab here, but the main person on this study was uh, Charlene. Charlene did uh, basically all of the uh, assays that I've shown you today. So yeah, thank you everyone. And I'm really happy to take any questions or obviously feel free to email me your questions as well. Thank you.